So in this video we will finish this first uh, introductory uh, lecture on how to calculate the sample size and now we will think about the variance that we need to use to calculate uh, the sample size. So uh, the, this is the formula that we have seen. So uh, this formula, the sample size, depends on how confident you want to be about the stop in the machine, uh, uh, how often, uh, how confident you want to be that you shouldn't stop the machine. So this is the probability of false positives, the probability of false negatives. And we have seen that uh, it also depends on how valuable your observations are and how fine, how, did, uh, how sensitive you want to be. So the first thing uh, that we should note is that there are multiple uh, that there are population parameters and, and sample parameters. So the tablets or the animals they have some mean and variance that are unknown to me. So oh, what I can see is I can take a number of samples I can x i and I can calculate the mean of those samples. So if I take a different sample, so I take other 20 tablets, I will compute, I will have a, a different estimate of my mean. So I, I have the sample mean and the sample variance that is calculated in this way, and the sample mean and the sample variance are not necessarily equal to the population mean and the population variance. These are random variables, the sample mean and, and sample variance, while the population mean and population variance, they are fixed values. So uh, I hope that my, uh, my mean and sample mean and variance, they fluctuate around the true value, and the larger the sample size, the smaller the fluctuations. So if I have very fi a, a, a lot of, of uh, samples, then my mean will be pretty accurate and my sample variance will also be pretty accurate. So this distinction between population and sample parameters is important. The other one is that there are many variables involved. So we have already seen a few. So we have the population variance, but the mean, our estimate of the, so this is the variability of the tablets, but we are calculating the mean, and the mean is a, is a, is a random variable. And as a random variable, it will also have a, a sigma squared. And I can also, for instance, if I repeat this experiment a few times and I see the variability of these estimates, I have the sample variance of the uh, of the mean variance. So that you can have many uh, uh, combinations of these concepts. And every time that you have a random variable, that random variable will have an associated variance. So the most important here is the distinction between the variance of the tablet and the variance of your estimate of the mean. That will be different. And also, uh, we can think of uh, how to, how to uh, change a bit the variability of our observations. So let's say that uh, you are measuring blood pressure and you do it in this way and this way uh, your observations uh, the person will have a true blood pressure let's say it doesn't change over time and, and then this true blood pressure is corrupted by noise. This noise is some random variable. This is a, a fixed value, but this is a random variable. And the variability of my observations will depend on the variability of the blood pressure between different people plus the variability of my observation. So for instance, measuring in this way is rather unstable. So means it means that this variability is, is relatively high. But then I can measure the same person multiple times. Let's say I measure it m times. So for the person i, I have the measurement 1, 2, 3, let's say. And then I compute the average of these three. So 
the I substitute the three measurements that I have from the same person, I substitute it by the average of the three. So this will be the, the, my measurement for that person. And uh, it is a very simple algebra. This, uh, this all uh, observation, this mean for this person will be the true blood pressure plus the noises that have been averaged. But because noise has average zero, uh, zero uh, expectation, so the mean is expected to be zero. It doesn't mean that in three samples it will always be zero, but it means that the average in the if I repeat this process infinite times will be zero. So this new random variable here will have zero mean and a standard deviation that is sigma squared divided by m. So the variations of my observations before it was the variability between people plus the noise. But now the noise is by, the, by m. So that means that uh, I can reduce the variability of my observations by measuring multiple times. So and the sigma that you need to use in your calculation formula is the is the sigma of your observations. But my observations now, they are the average of, uh, of uh, a smaller observations or, or the observations of a different hierarchy. So, so I can't reduce the sigma. This is the sigma that I need to use here to calculate the sample size. So if the sample size is, is too large, a possibility that you have is to increase, uh, is to decrease the variability of the observations by measuring multiple times and averaging. And, and this is a possibility. Another possibility is to use more precise uh, uh, equipment. So, for instance, the sigma squared of the of the noise. Uh, can be reduced if instead of doing an analogic uh, measurement like here, you make a digital uh, measurement. And then the digital device will be more precise than your uh, reading of the needle going down. So you can reduce the, the variability of your observations and this reduction will re result into a reduction of the number of samples that you need. And there is a, a correction that uh, you have to use if you are studying a finite a small uh, small populations. So let's say that I want to measure the blood pressure in Spain. So the blood, uh, Spain population is very large, especially compared to my sample size of 30. But if I want to uh, compute the blood pressure in this class, and this class has only 32 people, and I measure 30, I have very, very little uncertainty about what is the mean. So, because I, I have measured almost everyone. So, uh, if I am in Spain, my variance of, of the, my estimate of, sig of, of the mean, of the mean, is sigma squared divided by n, while if I'm in the class it will be sigma squared divided by n and then there is a factor that uh, corrects for the sample size uh, the sample size compared to the population size so for instance if I'm measuring 30 people out of 32 that means that my uncertainty about the mean is only 1 16th of the original uncertainty and this is a uh, nomenclature uh, issue. So repeated measures, multi uh, measuring multiple times is called repeated measures. Replication is when you repeat your experiment with a different group and it allows to estimate this sigma squared of, of the estimate of the mean. That is another uh, consideration regarding the, the variance that is, you may, uh, when, you, when you will do the test, you will compare the size, the effect size to the unexplained variance. This delta divided by sigma, sigma is the unexplained variance. And, and 
we will not see it in this course because this course is not about experimental design but you can watch the, the videos uh, with, uh, regarding the experimental design and, and the idea is that uh, this sigma the variation of your observations may have multiple sources we have seen the the variation between people uh, the variation uh, caused by the treatment so you are given a, you're comparing a control to a treatment so you hope that part of the by of the changes that you see in the numbers are caused by the treatment that is actually what you want to show and then you have the unexplained variance that for us it is noise but then uh, male and females they have different uh, blood pressures so part of the variability is also because of the of the gender and the other one this one now would represent the part that is not explained by gender so it is explained by age or uh, because of lifestyle or because of any other reason so if you don't separate uh, males from females you have them intermixed and then uh, you are comparing the if uh, the the effect size that is caused by your treatment to all other uh, uh, to all other variances that uh, you have not explained so you would have here you would be comparing this one to the sum of these three and this sum of these three is the one that you need to use in the calculation of the sample size but let's say that you separate by gender so by separating by gender you will be able to uh, identify which is the part of the blood pressure that depends on being male and female and then you will compare that the variability caused by the treatment to the so the delta you will compare it to the variability caused by all other sources that you have not explained so for instance age and lifestyle and the measurement noise so uh, this one has been taken out from the comparison and then uh, your comparisons will be much more powerful or reversely you can use many less uh, many less samples uh, so that so that uh, you can show the same effect with fewer samples okay so uh, uh, clarification on names so replication and replicates are something different so replication is when you repeat the experiment with different uh, individuals uh, when you have uh, uh, two groups and each one of the groups uh, the animals in each one of the groups are called replicates and a few ideas about sample size calculation so the sample size determination uh, will fail if the estimate of the sample variance is wrong so i am assuming that the vari the, they vary in with a given range if i'm wrong about it then my calculation uh, will be wrong if i'm only slightly wrong about the sample the, about the, the the variation the variance then the sample size will be only slightly wrong and uh, all these calculations they are based on the assumption of some distribution so for instance my uh, i'm assuming gaussianity if if my sample is not gaussian then my sample size will be wrongly calculated it is also assumed that the two populations have the same variance and if they don't again the sample size will be uh, incorrectly calculated uh, that, that the two populations are assumed to have the same distribution both to be gaussian and sometimes for instance uh, some variables are uh, log normal rather than normal meaning that if you take the logarithm uh, the logarithm is normal this happens to concentrations uh, to to number of cells any uh, number of copies of a, of a gene uh, so any process that is multiplicative in nature so the logarithm is 
normally distributed typically. Or if the large sample approximation does not apply, so this uh, we have seen it with the uh, blood pressure in Spain or the blood pressure in, in a class. So uh, if I'm uh, slightly off the assumptions, the sample size will be slightly off. If I'm totally off from my assumptions, my sample size will be totally incorrect. If the sample size is too large, you may try to change something. So you may try to increase the measurement repeatability and reproducibility, that is reducing sigma. I can try to introduce blocking variables as we did with the gender in the case of blood pressure to reduce the, the sigma again. We can try to use a variable with a better precision. So. Uh, if I can use a different device, for instance, this analog or digital devices to measure the blood pressure, then I, I should get the one with better precision. That is, that means lower variance. I also, for instance, you may uh, have an experiment and your treatment may cause a change in, let's say, uh, it causes a change in some metabolite in blood, but not only one, but a few of them. And some of the metabolites are more variable than others. So you may uh, measure the less variable ones so that they are easier to detect. The, the changes caused by your treatment are easier to detect. You can change the categorical, uh, you can change the response from less informative to more informative. So for instance, uh, uh, you can have a categorical response like yes or no, hypertension, yes or no, but, but those uh, variables have less information than a continuous variable. So if you measure the blood pressure as a number and you say, okay, this is 15.6 or 17.8, uh, so this has much more information than blood pressure high or low. And ordinal variables are a little bit in between. So ordinal variables, uh, they don't have as much information as the continuous, but the order is giving you some information. So uh, then, so for instance, an, an example of ordinal variable is uh, this uh, severity a grade, so you have three grades, let's say mild, uh, moderate, or severe. So the, the three uh, grades, are, the order of the grades are, are giving you some information. So if you can replace less informative variables by more informative variables, the sample size will reduce. And you can also identify covariates that can help to reduce the uncertainty. So for instance, with we cannot use equations now, at, but uh, because we don't have enough background for this. But in this modeling that we have done of the blood pressure, it might be that the room temperature is affecting the blood pressure. So I can measure the room temperature and the variability caused by the room temperature. I can uh, take it out from the comparison and then my sample size will also be smaller. And if you cannot do uh, any one of these, uh, then you should reduce either the confidence level of the test power. There is another way of reducing variance that is very effective, that is repeating measurements on the same subject as we did uh, measuring multiple times the blood pressure, or using paired samples. So for instance, you can measure the, the the blood pressure before applying the treatment and after applying the treatment. And then the person acts as its own control, and then you are uh, removing all these differences due to age or lifestyle, because you are uh, it is the same person that has been measured twice. And uh, sometimes you cannot use a parametric test because the data is not Gaussian and then you have equivalent non-parametric tests. So for instance, for the t-test of independent samples, you will use uh, this man whitney or wilcoxon rank sum. And if you have much uh, 
match uh, data, paired data, then you would use the parity test, and this is the non-parametric equivalent. Here you have the one-way uh, ANOVA, here is the equivalent, non-parametric equivalent. And as we already mentioned, the more information you add into the system, the smaller the sample size. So if you, uh, Gaussianity is information that you are adding in. So if you know that the sample is Gaussian, you can exploit this information to reduce the sample size. But if you don't know, then you will need a larger sample size. Unfortunately, uh, there are no formulas to calculate the sample size for non-parametric tests. So that means that you can use the, the parametric sample size calculation and then correct by something that is called the asymptotic relative efficiency. So this is a number between 0 and 1, so that uh, when you divide by this number, you increase a bit the, the sample size to account for the lack of information about the distribution. So you see that uh, uh, the man Whitney, for instance, it is about 5% of more samples. The Sperman co correlation test, so this Sperman is for uh, a substitute for Pearson correlation. So Sperman needs 10% more. If you are doing Kruskal Wallis test, Kruskal Wallis was the one uh, equivalent to ANOVA, then you need about 15% more. And if it is not in this table, you simply use uh, about 15% more. So uh, having a, a lack of information about the distribution results into a larger sample size. So some bad practices. So uh, one magic sample size, so let's say n equal 10 for all situations. So we have already learned that the sample size should be calculated uh, depending on what I want to detect and what is the level of noise of my observations. So if my if I don't control it and I put always n equal 10, implicitly what I'm doing is uh, being able to detect only effect sizes that are of a given size of the of the of the standard deviation. So this remind this uh, 1.5 delta divided by sigma. So I will be able only to detect changes, effect sizes, deltas, that are 1.5 times the sigma. And there is a sophisticated version of that, that is n equal 30, because the student t distribution is approximately normal for that size. This is true, but uh, this n equal 30 uh, is, uh, again, a bad practice because it is like n equal 10. There is nothing special about n equal 30. Um, and then uh, if you have a, a, a finite uh, population, so for instance with n total individuals, some people recommend to use a square root of n total plus 1. And again, you are fixing implicitly the effect size that you will be able to detect and you are not aware of which is this detection limit. And some people use this coins D, and D is delta divided by sigma. And, and you have here, for instance, a, a sample size for given powers and uh, different Ds. So for instance, uh, for a D of 0 0.8, that is, you want to detect something that is 0 0.8 times the, 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 the standard deviation and you want to have a high power you will need about 42 samples and the smaller the D so, so small, the larger the sample size so this is this is fine but uh, this is assuming normality and it was derived under a given context so if you are out of that context then using the coins D and this table is, is useless. It doesn't represent your, uh, your problem. And another bad practice is to think that the sample size and the power calculations that we have done are exact. So when we calculate n equal, equal 13, that this 13 is written in a stone. 
the, we, we ha have calculated that in the context of high uncertainty, especially we have to say which is sigma, and we haven't performed the experiment yet, so we don't know exactly what sigma will be. So we are assuming that it will be in this range, but, but it doesn't mean that this is the true, absolutely true sigma. And uh, if the sample variance is unknown, then there is no way you can compute the sample size. It is like uh, designing an elevator for aliens. So if you don't know how variable these aliens are, you cannot design an elevator for them. So either you do uh, some uh, literature uh, exploring, exploration, so that uh, you try to identify what sigma could be reasonably, or you perform a pilot study. And there are some more bad practices. So, in given contact uh, context, there is this zero acceptance uh, 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 plan, sampling plan. So that means, for instance, I want to uh, check uh, whether a batch of chemicals is is corrupted or not, and then I check f uh, one by one all the chemical bottles. And if I don't find uh, any uh, corrupt, corruption in N, then I assume that the whole batch is, is not corrupted. And, and that is a good uh, plan. But uh, thinking that this is uh, superior to any other sampling is not, is not correct. And the reason is that uh, often these plans are poorly understood and they may be appropriate or not to, to your particular case. Uh, computing the post-experiment power is a useful indicator of the value of a, an experiment. So this is an incorrect uh, statement. The reason is that uh, at these post-experiment power, power calculations, they are assuming that the alternative the effect size of the alternative is the one that you have observed. So in the example of the tablet, that the true nature of or the true state of nature is 0 0.66 milligrams of difference. And then the, the power calculation is, is just another way of reporting the p-value. So given the p-value, you can compute what is the power uh, for that effect size that you have calculated and, and vice versa. Uh, another uh, misconception is that you need a special software to calculate the sample size and test power. This is in a, in a way true, but it is also not true. So it is true that to make an exact calculation you need software, but uh, to make an approximate calculation you can do by hand. And, and these uh, by hand calculation should be uh, in the ballpark range of the calculation done by the software. And if it is not, then you have made a mistake in either of the two. But you want to use uh, multiple uh, calculation methods to be sure that the sample size is the one that you really want. Uh, you cannot calculate the sample size if you don't know how the data will be analyzed. And the reason is that uh, every sample size calculation is adapted to the way that you will analyze your data. We saw that uh, when we uh, used uh, the tablet example, we first uh, exposed how the data would be analyzed and then Based on that, we were able to calculate the sample size. Uh, an experiment may be practically significant. So a, a misconception is that an experiment can be practically significant, but not statistically significant. Sometimes uh, we are, uh, as researchers, we try to, we are very excited about our results. And the p-value is not significant, but still we see such a big difference for us that uh, we want to report it. If it is not statistically significant, and can, I cannot be sure that that, that big change is, is not because of, of noise. So, uh, to be practically significant, first 
the experiment must be statistically significant. The converse is not true. So, for instance, let's say that you have a, a drug that decreases the area, uh, the lesion area from 50 to 49.5, and you have so much animals that uh, you can, are able to show that that is very, very small, tiny difference is statistically significant. And, but still, it is useless pr from a practical point of view. Then, on the other side, we have good practices. So, good practice is to calculate the sample size and the power and the effect size before collecting the data. So, and the reason is that you are sure that you will have enough and not too much data to meet the goal of your experiment. Uh, if it is necessary, perform a pilot test study to estimate the variance. Actually, uh, you get a similar kind of information if you analyze some previous publication. So, if there is something published, uh, you get almost the, the variance with more precision from that publication than from your pilot study. The reason is that that publication probably the sample size is larger than your pilot study uh, uh, sample size. And increase the sample size to compensate for anticipated losses at random. So if we foresee that 20% of the animals will be lost, then we increase the sample size such that when we lose 20%, still we have enough samples. Uh, before collecting your data, make sure that the experiment design meets the goals. Uh, there are uh, situations in which uh, this is very critical and even uh, the data collection and analysis is simulated to make sure that uh, we will have enough sample size. The power calculation, um, uh, use power calculation to design the experiment. So uh, this kind of uh, reasonings that we have been doing in the previous slides and, and report always confidence intervals. So never report just the mean value of the difference, but always report the confidence interval of that difference. <coughs> I always recommend to use at least two methods to calculate the sample size, two softwares, one manual calculation and a software, just to make sure that there is no mistake. The, the, the problem with softwares is that sometimes they make questions that we don't understand and then we put a number there, but this is not the, uh, the number that the software was, was expecting. So making the calculation with two softwares is, is a good idea. And writing a summary of all these steps is good because uh, when uh, we do the experiment and we see uh, if it fails, then we can go back to our notes and, and realize that maybe what the sigma that we assumed for the sample size calculation was too small or was too large compared to the real sigma. So if you are interested in these things, you can uh, expand uh, uh, this these ideas in these chapters, also the books that I gave you at the beginning of the lectures, and also the statistical software used to calculate the sample size. They have very good user guides, and in these user guides you can learn a lot uh, about uh, sample size calculations. Uh, here I'm uh, supplying some web calculators uh, for sample sizes. And as a summary, uh, you uh, take home messages would be that the sample size calculation are particular to the way the data will be analyzed. So if you don't know how the data will be analyzed, you cannot calculate the sample size. The goal of hypothesis testing is to prove that the null hypothesis is false. So we can never uh, accept the null hypothesis, we can reject it. And that is why the research hypothesis has to be in the alternative. There are five variables that are strongly related. The sample size, the population variance, the confidence level, the test power, and the effect size. And given four of them, the fifth one can be calculated. And <coughs> 
we can measure the variance of many uh, different but related variables so we have distinguished between population variance sample variance the variance of the sample mean and so on so they are all related but they are not the same and my uh, final message I wouldn't put it as as tough as this guy but all these uh, calculations they are uh, rather complicated and unfortunately in, in current science the, the scientist needs to know about biology about animals about anesthetics and about many other things and also about the statistics and probably these uh, fields are too different and, and you don't need to be an expert in all of them so I would always recommend to team up with someone who is uh, more uh, proficient in this kind of calculations so that uh, you don't make mistakes and you don't and you don't need to so you don't uh, do this post-mortem analysis in which you realize that you made a mistake in the sample size calculation or the experiment design at the beginning and then you have spoiled your experiment so this would be all and with this we finish this first uh, lecture